Welcome to Coloradan Conversations. Three times a year, we send the Coloradan Alumni Magazine to forever buffs across the globe. And you call us and send us incredible letters and emails. You've shared that a photo can spur 50-year-old memories. You've told us about reconnecting with classmates and about businesses and research being strengthened when alumni collaborate. Many of you have used a particular story as a springboard to engage in conversations with us about challenging and thought-provoking topics. So we decided to create conversations that include you, bringing together CU's world-class faculty, students, alumni, and community members. Conversations are powerful. Conversations coupled with action create change. Thank you for joining us and your fellow Forever Buffs for this conversation. If you'd like to connect after the event, email me at editor at colorado.edu. Go Buffs! Welcome to the third and final CU Boulder Colorado Conversations of 2021. To those of you who joined us for the first two episodes, thank you for being here. If this is your first time joining us, you are in for a special treat. Before we dive in, I would like to mention what this event is being, is being closed captioned. To access these captions, please click on the CC button located on the right hand side in the bottom hand side of the toolbar of your Zoom window in order to ensure the safety for everyone participating in person here in this studio, we would like to assure you that the audience members that we are in compliance with all CDC guidelines in order to bring you tonight's event. As a reminder, this series was built in partnership with the CU Boulder community, CU Boulder's Chancellor, Philip DeStefano, the Alumni Association and the Coloradan Magazine to bring Coloradan stories to life through community conversations and engagement. This series promises to stir intellectual curiosity and begin to build the foundation for taking action on the important issues we discuss. We're so glad to be back this evening as we come together to discuss something that is near and dear to my heart, leadership. Once again, I'm your host, Albus Brooks, and I'm a proud forever buff. I graduated from CU Boulder in 2001 with a degree in religious studies and political science. I now serve as the vice president of Millinder White, a construction development firm. For just over eight years, I served as a member of Denver City Council. And before that, I was a community organizer with Denver's underprivileged youth. Before I introduce the panelists who will be joining the discussion, let's watch a short video to give context to this conversation. To me, leadership is trust, passion, and community. To me, leadership is service, empathy, and initiative. To me, leadership is service, initiative, and teamwork. For me, leadership is guidance, community, and empathy. To me, leadership means courage, ownership, and respect. I believe that the best leaders are community builders. They're people that are able to bring others together instead of, you know, separating other people and making their own little sex. Service is the core of leadership. A common misconception, I think, is that the people who are subordinate in some type of situation are there to serve their leader, serve their managers. Uh, but true leaders are really at the service of others. They understand that it's their role to listen to people and to help them achieve what their goals are and to encourage them in doing that. The first word that pretty much comes to mind when I talk about leadership is empathy. We see the examples of, of what we consider leadership right now have to do a lot with um, how you connect with others, how do you, how you empower others, and I think a lot of has to do with how you empathize with others. Sometimes being a leader, you need courage to talk about things that are difficult with your peers and set the tone or certain things that are not um, the commonly talked about issues and setting a pace or a tone for your team or your environment can be difficult. I chose service because I believe that 
the way to understand the needs of those around you and the best exercise your leadership abilities is to serve in your community and that way you can understand where people are struggling and how you can best help them. The Center for Leadership has been a vital partner in developing the summer issue of the Colorado as well as this event. The student leaders we just heard from are incredible. And one of them, Brian Marete, is here with us tonight. I'm also joined by two outstanding CU faculty members who serve as leadership experts on campus. All three of the panelists have shared some of their fantastic insight in the Colorado. Tonight, they are here to expand on those thoughts and share their advice for current and inspiring leaders. Dr. Stephanie Johnson, Dr. Shiloh Brooks, both professors at CU Boulder, and Brian Marethe, a third year engineering student are joining us for this important conversation tonight. I'm gonna to turn the introductions over to them, starting with Dr. Stephanie Johnson. Hi, thank you for that introduction. Thank you so much for being here today and so continuing to support CU uh, in this important conversation. I am Dr. Stephanie Johnson, and I'm a professor of management at the Leeds School of Business at CU. And um, I write on the topic of leadership and just published a book last year on this topic called Inclusify, which is about how leaders can create more inclusive workplaces. Excellent. Now, Dr. Shiloh Brooks. I'm Shiloh Brooks. I am a teaching associate professor in the College of Engineering. I am faculty director of the Engineering Leadership Program, whose mission I uh, reoriented a few years ago. Um, and I also direct a center on campus called the Benson Center. Um, and Brian is my student, and he's next. Hello, everyone. Yeah, my name is Brian Moravi. I'm a third year student, just like Alba said, in the creative technology and design major. I'm also part of the engineering leadership program. So like Dr. Brooks said, I have studied under him before. I've also uh, won the Center for Leadership's Student Leader of the Year for 2021. I was one of the five recipients, and I'm also on the student board for the Center for Leadership. Excellent. Brian, I was going to ask you to mention that incredible award that you won. And so on behalf of all of us, uh, you know, former CU buffs, we just want to say congratulations. We're very proud of you. We're excited that you all are here. And professors, thank you for being here. I'm excited about the discussion. Now, before we dive into the conversation, we want to hear from you, the audience, to get a sense of who's joining us today. The first two questions are multiple choice. Please submit your answers to those uh, when you are prompted on your screen. The third question is a short uh, answer and you can just share your response uh, in the chat there so that the panelists and attendees see uh, what they can do. So here are the first two questions. Number one, please answer. Are you currently serving in a former Formal, formal, sorry, leadership role or position, yes or no? And number two, do you see yourself as a leader, yes or no? Okay, we're going to go over here and, and, and check out uh, this poll, and this is really interesting. So for the first question, are you currently serving in a formal leadership role it looks like we got over 50%, almost 60% of people say yes. And 40%, 40 uh, just over 40 are saying no. This is good. This is going to lead us, is leadership positional, right? It's going to lead us into a good conversation around this. So this is really good. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm already prompted in some questions here. Um, and number two, do you see yourself as a leader? We got some leaders here. Come on now. 98%. Those 3%, that one person who said no, we're going to convince you uh, by the end here. And now the third. Share what your leadership role or position is. Just put it, just pop it into the chat. 
we're going to start seeing it get populated here. Uh, we would love to see that. Give you a minute to do just that. Okay, are we getting some answers there? All right, yeah, we are, here we go. We got, um, I'm gonna read a few of them, Director of communi Communications, um, in spirit, okay. I don't know what that means, but uh, okay. Global organization, okay, now they're starting a manager, remote staff, good, good. So we have some folks here that are in, um, very leadership positions, which is really great. Thank you guys, retired SVP. Okay, we got some principles here. Um, good. Maybe a couple more. All right, board directors. There's some real leaders in here, and I'm excited that uh, for that second question, that 90% of the individuals on this call feel like they're a leader. All right, now let's get into some of the discussion and really start engaging um, this incredible panel uh, that we have here. So first, our first question is, I really want you guys to think about this, um, and, and we'll start with you, Dr. Shiloh. Um, I want, I want the, the viewers to get a sense of your leadership styles. So in each of your leadership experience, what is the most important leadership skill? Start us off, Dr. Brooks. Well, one of the things that, you know, we try to emphasize in our, in our engineering leadership program, and one of the things that's benefited me throughout my life is a, what I would call a sense of curiosity and wonder about the world. Um, the world is an extraordinarily complex uh, place full of nuances, which it takes a lifetime to understand. And the kinds of problems that come your way um, as a leader are never predictable. Their character is unknown. And it's often true that they're unique to you. Um, if you think of great leaders of the past, maybe someone like uh, people we study in my program, like Abraham Lincoln, uh, the kind of problem that, that he faced was, was entirely new in a way on the earth. This is true of someone of his stature, but also of someone who's running a team at a company that faces a difficulty which the company has never um, faced before. And so to be a leader, one has to uh, have a broad sense uh, and an interest in all sorts of things because one knows what's gonna come one's way. You wanna give yourself a tool belt that's as versatile as possible to deal with the unpredictable um, and frankly unprecedented problems that you might find. And, you know, I think it's, you know, it's important to be able to think for yourself, um, to challenge your views and assumptions and to read widely, to read deeply and to look at the world as a place um, uh, of, of intense beauty and wonder. Excellent, thank you for that. Brian, your thoughts? Um, to me, personally, I think a really important skill for leadership is community building, uh, being able to build relationships with uh, the people you're working with, to be able to build that trust with the people you surround yourself with, I think is a really important skill because it kind of builds a network of people helping each other, and it's a more natural flow to get things done. Uh, like I said, people have more trust in each other, there's more motivation for people in your group to participate if everyone has that nice relationship with each other that basically an extended family would have through a community. I like that. I like that. Good answer. Um, Dr. Johnson, your thoughts. I love both of the previous answers. That's, um, I, you know, I agree with both of those things for sure. Um, I really was impacted by the student who started out in the presentation who said for her leadership is service. And that really resonates with me. I think in my leadership style is the servant leader who's focused on the success of the people who are following you or supporting you. Um, and I think the number one skill that leaders need to have is empathy. And so that they can understand how to best serve the people um, who they're serving. I think it's the leadership, most essential leadership skill for tomorrow is empathy. And I think we've really seen that play out over the COVID-19 pandemic where you know, this is an unprecedented times, a really difficult situation. And 
it requires more than ever just that requirement that you're listening to people and um, caring about them and supporting them. Oh, this is going to be good. Okay. I can already see we're going to new levels. I, and I hope that folks who are listening in are saying, wow, these are some things that I necessarily wouldn't say. Um, but you all captured, I think, I love, Dr. Johnson, what you just said, that the, what is the leader of tomorrow? What is, who are they going to be? What are they going to become? What do they need? What are the intangibles that they need? I think this is really good. Um, so I have a, a, another question for you all, and we'll go in reverse order. We'll, we'll start with uh, Dr. Johnson here. Who, who's an example of a leader in your life? Oh, well, that's a great question. So, uh, you know, a couple of our leads leaders are here on the call. I saw our uh, Gordon Trafton and Alan Balliger are our um, board chairs and the at the leads board, and I think they exemplify those characteristics of having um, empathy, listening, you know, I study inclusive leadership. They're both incredibly inclusive. And so I truly, truly did not know they would be here today, but I saw their uh, responses in the chat. And so there are a couple of close leaders, like people I get to interact with, um, but there's so many great examples, I think, in society of, you know, leaders right now who are doing more than we could have ever really expected leaders to step up and do. Um, I was just reading, reading about Angela Merkel today, and I think she's a great example of a leader who's just exemplifies so many of the things that I'm talking about and has humility. Uh, and I could do this all day, but I'll pause. <laughs> right no, those are good examples. Dr. Brooks. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I think there are a number of people who I, who I look up to who are living. Um, Certainly Cornell West and Robert George, the kind, if you don't know of them, you should look them up, the conversations that they have uh, about the importance of free inquiry, both of them leaders, uh, uh, both people who disagree deeply, but who come together, you know, in a spirit of, of uh, mutual inquiry. So I think, you know, people like that, um, both, both professors at various institutions, but, but the, um, you know, the folks who, who really inspire me are some of the people who we, we try to read in, in our courses. I, I often think, um, of, of uh, an ancient Greek man named Xenophon, who was a student of Socrates, who was a general um, and who led 10,000 Greeks, uh, Greek mercenaries out of Persia when an expedition they were on failed, but then went on to write some of the richest philosophic books in, in, in history. A person who has the intellectual athleticism to do these sorts of things. I think of people like Frederick Douglass, a man who covered an extraordinary amount of ground in his life from being an enslaved human being all the way to being the greatest rhetorician in the United States uh, over and against uh, Abraham Lincoln would be his only rival. That's an extraordinary journey to travel in one lifetime. I think of Winston Churchill, who saved the West from the specter of National Socialism, also wrote uh, more books than Shakespeare and Charles Dickens combined and painted 500 canvases in his lifetime. Um, this is an extraordinary person. And so these are the kinds of people who, who really break down our conceptions of what a human being is, what a leader can do, uh, who I look up to. You see, Dr. Brooks is not playing. He's over here dropping leadership bombs, okay? Awesome, awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Brian, you're up. Uh, yeah, I definitely agree with you. Everyone can get a taste of what it feels like to be in Dr. Brooks's class after this. But uh, <laughs> uh, a leadership example that I, I chose was my father, just because he was the first real example I saw of a community builder in my life. Uh, my parents are not originally from the U.S. They immigrated from Kenya. And one of the first things they did when coming to Colorado was to make sure to find uh, other Kenyans that they could connect with that could help them, you know, adjust to living in the U.S. And ever since uh, they immigrated there here, he's been building that community. He has a uh, one of the quotes he lives by is, I, I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine. It's kind of like, uh, if I help you out, then and in the future, I know you'll be there to help me out too. And slowly over the years, that builds the kind of relationships that make the Kenyan community what it is today. You know, you know as, a, as a former politician, I love that uh, quote. Uh, it's, a, it's a great quote. Awesome. I, I, I actually want to share, um, I want to share one of mine. Um, and it's my mother. And, and uh, since you sh shared 
about your father. I, I shared this at another one of our conversations, but uh, my, my mother was born in a box because um, she, she was the first African-American born in Lake Village, Arkansas, and they put her in a box so she wouldn't contaminate uh, the rest of the white children. Um, and she came from that place and got her PhD at UCLA in education. And from that day forward, she has been fighting for education, uh, education equality for all people, um, especially those who have been marginalized for the rest of her life. And so she's in Colorado right now. She's being recognized um, by Colorado Education uh, Fund right now because of her work for students who are poor, who are not getting the education that they deserve. And it's like that, that thread of her life that started in a very racist South um, has now turned into this beautiful opportunity where she provides opportunities for other. And, and, and that is my definition of leadership, right? Is, wow, a leader who can say, you know what? This happened to me, but I had the vision and the foresight to go ahead and remove barriers uh, for others. So I love that you all each had some of those examples. Let's, let's dig a little bit deeper. How do you learn leadership and how do you bring your own leadership style to it, right? Like, how do you do that? And you guys are the experts. So Dr. Brooks, how do you do that? Yeah, I mean, I would say it's an open question about whether leadership can be taught. I, I, I ask my students that question. I, I, uh, I honestly don't know. I mean, I think of other talents people have, such as playing the cello or playing basketball, and some of these are, are learned, and some of these, I suspect, are, this comes from some God-given, you know, um, talent. And so it's not clear to me whether leadership is one of those or whether it's a different thing which can be acquired um, uh, via study. Uh, one of the things I'm fairly confident about, though, is that the conventional instruments of academic measurement, like tests and textbooks and slides, I suspect these don't quite get at it if it can be taught. Um, but I, I think one way to begin to think about it is to, to think about uh, the way in which a leader is required to be a kind of perpetual student of human nature. And by that, I mean I can't say whether you can teach someone to be a great leader, but you can learn more about the way human beings work. And if your job is to lead human beings, to think about the kinds of things that they can and can't do, uh, to motivate them to do things which they might think and you might think are impossible, you should begin to think about what kinds of things do human beings long for? What motivates them? What do they want uh, out of justice? What do they want out of love? What do they think is noble and base? What makes them happy? What makes them unhappy? What do they think is good and evil? How do their hearts and minds and spirits work? And so I think that th this kind of knowledge is learnable in conventional academic uh, ways. And this kind of knowledge can color um, someone's uh, judgment, someone's, it can educate their character. These sorts of things are formable. And so I think you, you have to start, um, you have to start there. Yeah, very important points. Uh, Brian, any thoughts on this? Uh, yeah, I do agree that uh, it would be something kind of hard to teach and that you kind of just have to learn about humans and kind of learn about life. And I think a good way to do that is kind of uh, look to the past or just ask other people who have been in those shoes before you. So something I do a lot is uh, seek out advice from different mentors, people that are older than me, people that have just you know, experienced life longer than I have. And I think just gaining those little nuggets of wisdom and then studying other leaders from the past, you can learn one skill from this leader, get another skill from this other leader, and then kind of create your own style by merging things that you like from the past. You don't necessarily have to come up with something completely new. Uh, just take what you like from the people that you aspire to be like. And you'll become a great leader in no time. That's great. Dr. Johnson? I am going to be more similar to Brian in my answer, because in this case, I totally disagree with Shiloh, because I know, or Dr. Brooks, because I know leadership can be learned. Is it well taught? Like, are we good at teaching it? You can say maybe some people are, but um, there's great research studies that look at twins. And so they measure the extent to which leadership is hereditary or an inborn trait. And there's clearly evidence that some of leadership is 
inborn, um, particularly leader emergence rather than effectiveness, like who's seen as a leader. So you might think of some really basic things like your sex, um, which is determined at birth, might influence the extent to which you're a leader because men tend to be viewed as more leader-like um, because of stereotypes. So there is obviously a genetic component, but those research studies show that most of leadership is learned. And that's over the course of a lifetime. It's through early experiences that people have, you know, if it's before even coming to a school like CU, you know, we ask students questions about their leadership experience because those things do predict future um, leadership. And then when folks are in college, this is, I mean, I believe this is why we're there as faculty, you know, and that's why we're creating the Center for Leadership because I wholeheartedly believe that we can lay this, the foundation for future leadership through what we teach. And I think so much of it is what Brian said. It's, you know, the mentoring experiences that people have observing leaders. Um, and then I know some of it can be taught in the classroom. Like some of the things like empathy is a learned skill. The thing that I thought was the most important skill for the leaders of tomorrow can be enhanced, right? Um, being inclusive, reducing unconscious bias, all of those things we know have a learning component and we can teach it. So I am on the far camp of, we're, we're not going to educate leaders and someone's going to leave and say, okay, now I'm a leader because learning to lead is a lifelong process, right? No one's ever done. If you think you're done, you're probably not doing it right. Um, but it can certainly, certainly be taught. You bring up some good points. And I think this might be the first time that we've had two professors disagree. And we encourage that because that yes. is how, <laughs> that is how we, we learn, right? Like, we want to have these different opinions and viewpoints because I think that's how we grow. And so well, uh, I totally I'm, agree. And I particularly love disagreeing with Shiloh because he loves disagreement. So it's <laughs> this is the so to that point, <laughs> Dr. Brooks, did you have a, uh, a rebuttal to, to those remarks? No, I mean, I, I think that those things um, are certainly of interest to me. I, I would say, um, I would say that, uh, you know, there are, I, I guess the only thing I would quibble with is that the, the notion that the classroom is a place to learn empathy. The classroom is a sterile environment of desks yeah. and chalk and laptops. Um, the education of the heart doesn't necessarily take place via Canvas um, or any of these sorts of things. It, it takes place, and I think uh, Dr. Johnson agrees with this because she emphasizes the fact that leadership is, is a lifelong process. And so my, my view would be you can you can set uh, the ship of the soul uh, on its journey in a classroom, but the real education isn't gonna happen until someone meets the, the, sort of the hard lessons of life. And so yes. what we can do in the classroom is, is a preparatory activity. It's not necessarily imparting leadership the way my students take courses in calculus. And by the time they get to the end of those courses, they all have to be able to solve certain equations and they all have to get the same answer or else they fail the course and have to take it again. I don't know that leadership gives itself over to such academic analysis. It doesn't seem to me to, um, uh, to be subject to the same standards of evaluation and therefore the same pedagogical methods. Um, it's, a, it's a sort of wholly different beast in my view. I don't know that she would even disagree with that though. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I, I'm going to jump in here because I just think this is a teachable moment um, for all of us in America <laughs> right now, in our political systems and everything. Do you all see the banter, the disagreement, and yet the collaboration and even support? This is not happening in our country. We cannot disagree anymore and still support each other. So I just want to take this uh, commercial break to say, this is what it looks like to have open debate, intellectual curiosity, and still support each other. Okay, we're back uh, to this leadership um, conversation. I love this, and I think this will be a lifelong debate because there are those in the, you were born, you were LeBron James, you were, you know, and there are the, oh, you're, you're trained, you're taught, and I, and I think part of the complexity of this is it's a mixture. Maybe it's a mixture. Maybe it's a little bit. It's not, it's not a black and white conversation. It's, it's much more nuanced. Um, but I want to take us to the question that we saw here that said, 
99%, this was an interesting question. 99% of the folks said, yes, I am a leader. But only 50%, 55% thought that they were in leadership positions. Does anyone want to, the three of you all, I, I mean, I, why do we see that? If you're a leader, why are you not in a leadership position? That's my question. I don't understand that. Anybody want to take that on? Just jump in. Uh, I think okay, maybe I the okay, responsibility. There you go, Thank you, Brian. Come on, baby. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, I think some of the responsibilities that might come with a formal leadership position isn't necessarily for everyone, but they might have those uh, kind of skills where people look to them for advice or look to them for guidance. So, yeah. Interesting. Yep. Dr. That's Johnson, why Brian is the leader because um, he's stepping up to answer the question. That's <laughs> awesome. And saying all the right things. I think, um, you know, I think that's right. I, I don't think people necessarily have to hold a formal title or I know they don't have to hold a formal title to be a leader. Like there's self-leadership, the things that you're doing to self-regulate and ensure your success. And there's leadership in lots of informal contexts. And I think really what we need today is a lot more people stepping up to exhibit leadership behaviors. And I love that people see themselves as leadership because I think if we can empower people to, to feel like they have the capability or like they are leaders, then we can create so much more change because we're not just sitting around waiting for someone else, you know, some person with a title to do all the things. We're getting, like, if you look at the chat, like, these are amazing questions. These are great, great questions that people are posing. I'm like, I'm supposed to be listening, but I'm like reading all the questions. Hey, yeah, we want you to focus on this because we will go to the yes. uh, audience portion here soon. So you guys keep the <laughs> questions coming. <laughs> Dr. Track. Johnson, please stay <laughs> focused. No, um, there's, it's just an example. I mean, I think if you look at yeah. the things that people are saying, um, I think it's an example of, how much power each of us really has. And I, you know, in the context of things like inclusion, or, you know, in some of my research, I found that people report feeling invisible at work. Like no one sees them, no one knows who they are. And, you know, sometimes it just takes one person to see you and give you that respect and acknowledgement and praise. And they don't have to be your boss. It's great if they are your boss or someone with a title, but really it just takes a person, like a human being to do that. And that's, to me, that's leadership. That's great. Dr. Brooks, you want to tackle this, this before we jump on? Um, I'm, I'm satisfied with those answers. I mean, I, I agree. And, 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 and maybe I'll speak more about this later, but that a formal title is, um, it's not required and that, that there are all sorts of things that one can do um, yeah. and, and uh, to, to, to be a leader without um, being paid for it or having any sort of title. Um, so I, I yeah, let me just give a, a quick example, I think these, um, these faculty and the student really said it all, but I'm living this out. I'm, a, I'm, I'm living what this is. I was the president of Denver City Council, a very powerful position in the city of Denver, which um, was the second in command of the city, did all these things. Today, in a private sector position, I have more influence in the city of Denver than I did as the president of Denver City Council. I'm telling you right now, title and position has nothing to do with it. Influence and leadership is where it's at. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but I wanna get dive into these questions. I'm so excited because I'm seeing these questions. We're gonna go on for a little bit longer talking to, um, to our panelists and then we're gonna dive into uh, these folks who are online because wow, look at these questions, they're great. Okay, here we go. How uh, we didn't really talk about style. We didn't really talk about your style and leadership. And I think we have to cover that because I get really upset. Okay, I'm, I'm putting my own bias in. I'm supposed to be working on this, uh, Dr. Johnson, my bias. But my bias is that all these leadership programs that as an African-American man that I was a part of for years, there were all these old white dudes, you know, to be honest with you. And I had to be like them. I had to sit talk like them and I had to mirror them and I it wasn't until a leader told me actually leadership is bringing who you are to the table where you come from your life experiences and so 
tell us how to delve, dive into this. How, how do people find their leadership? How do they, how does it come from deep within? Um, Dr. Johnson, what, help us here. Oh my gosh. I love what you just said. And I think, I, I mean, I have the same experience and in, in leadership, but also in just like being a professor, I'm like a Mexican American woman business professor. There's not, I think I am the one <laughs> there's not, there's not many. Um, and I think I did the same, like, I'm going to wear the suit and try to act like everyone else. And, you know, that wasn't serving the other women who I taught the other Mexican American students I taught by just acting like the norm. And that's, I mean, that's really what the focus of Inclusify is. It's about what people really need to be included is the feeling of belonging, like being accepted and valued for, for who you are, which means you also have to have your unique identity as part of the conversation. And I think that's what, it sounds like what you're saying was missing. And I'm gonna mm -hmm. guess you thrived so much more and inspired so many more people and led so much more effectively when you didn't have to do all of the things to be a leader while also acting, right? That's just like a lot to do. And it's not, you know, bringing along as many people as you otherwise could or changing some of those, their stereotypes or like um, the types of leadership programs people go to, I think need to be more diverse because there's different styles. So Definitely. I think that that's like, to me, that's the heart of the issue. Like if we could get there and let everyone as leaders be themselves, so that our the teams feel that they can be themselves because in being yourself, you're also allowing other people that psychological safety that they can be themselves too, right? Because if they see you doing it, then, and you're the boss, you're the second in command, the person who's wielding all the power, either through formal title or through influence, then you're setting the opportunity for other people to do it too. So I just love, love, love that you said that. Good thoughts. Good thoughts. Brian, Dr. Brooks, any, any thoughts on this? Um, I, I think it just comes with practice and experience. Like for me personally, I wasn't always, you know, ready to have conversations like this and ready to talk to people, you know, that like leadership kind of fashion, <clears throat> but just uh, slowly taking on positions, practicing, you know, talking with people, uh, doing those kind of things, I think is what will help you get your own style. You, you start to uh, find out what works for you, what doesn't work for you, how you like to approach people, how you like to delegate different things. So just getting that little leadership experience along the way just helps a lot. That's great. Dr. Brooks, anything you got there? Yeah, I mean, the only thing that occurs to me, I certainly uh, agree with uh, the, the notion that there are a variety of ways to be in the world. And it's very important for each individual to find uh, that way of being which is most native to them. The, but the, the other thing that occurs to me to, to deepen the reflection is merely to say that uh, style is, is only the first step. And in a way, style is changeable. When you, know, you think about your hairstyle or your clothing style, these might change with the years. And so make sure that there's a part of you that's not merely that. Make sure that there's a part of you that is uh, founded on principle. And, and I have in mind something, some part of you that's not merely um, a way of being in the world, but is, is so um, uh, permanent, a part of your being that uh, it's, it, 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 it motivates you. And, and so I, I think about reasonable, defensible principles, which you then deploy by way of being in the world the way that you are most comfortable doing so. Um, and, and so, so don't lose sight of that and, and have some things that you've thought through that you can defend that, that, that can't change or that, that aren't susceptible to, um, to mere style, but certainly find the best way of being in the world. Love that. Love that. That's really, really important. Um, I'm going to, we're going to have one more question and then we're going to jump over to a poll question and then it's, it's all audience. Come on audience. We're ready. Um, okay. Here's the last question. What are we doing to support current and aspiring leaders at CU Boulder today? And what could we be doing better to support and cultivate, especially student leaders? Looks like we lost Dr. Brooks, but Brian, you want to, let's go from uh, your perspective. Yeah, first. for sure. I can, there I can talk is. about the Center for Leadership and I'm sure Dr. Brooks can speak on the engineering leadership program, but 
the Center for Leadership right now, what they're trying to do is be like an umbrella group for all the different leadership programs in all the different schools, like, you know, like the Leeds Leadership Program, the Engineering Leadership Program, the Athletic Leadership Program, and so on and so on. Uh, and so I think that's doing a really good job of, of bringing all these different student leaders together to interact with each other and get uh, those different perspectives that they wouldn't usually get just hanging around people from their own school. And so part of what I'm doing along with several other student leaders on the board this year is trying to plan events and other kinds of things that will bring these students together and encourage them to start working with each other. That's great. <clears throat> Dr. Johnson? Yeah, so um, exactly what Brian said. You know, I think, I think we're, as a university, we're taking huge strides in creating more leadership opportunities for those who step up to seize them. So, you know, we um, le at Leeds, the business school, we have a great mentoring program um, and we're trying to do something very similar in the Center for Leadership. So it's not just business students, but offer mentorship opportunities, service opportunities, connection and collaboration with leaders in the community and leaders in business. I think you also, I think asked what we're not maybe doing as, as well. And I guess to me, I don't know that we're always reaching the, some of the students who wouldn't have agreed with that poll of, I see myself as a leader. Mm -hmm. There's definitely people we don't ever see in the Center for Leadership. And um, I think we could do more to bring them in. Like, I don't think everyone has to be a leader, but everyone can demonstrate leadership. And so I think the opportunities we're providing are bigger than just preparing students to be, you know, leaders on campus and future leaders in business, but also just like, you know, that focus on leading with principles and ethics, I think are important things for anyone to be talking about. And I know one study on student leadership showed that engaging in um, leadership programming improved mental health outcomes, which I think is a big issue for all college students and certainly on our campus. And so I think we could, we still have more opportunity to try to reach people, especially coming in, I think, in their freshman year who haven't found their way um, and bring them in and give them some of those skills and human connection, you know, maybe a place to belong. Um, and so maybe that's like the next the next area. Right. Dr. Brooks. Yeah, I, I mean, I think CU's done a really terrific job. I mean, if you just look at what uh, Dr. Johnson's done at the Center for Leadership with our mutual colleague, Aaron Roof, I mean, this is a chancellor level center. I you know the, the chief uh, officer of the campus supports this. I mean, that's that's got to be, you know, unique in higher education. And the fact that progr programs like, like mine can exist in the College of Engineering, I mean, that's, that's just astonishing. And so I, I think CU's done a, done a really terrific job. Um, I, I, you know, I think, you know, you ask, well, what could we be doing better? I mean, one of the things, and this is going to be peculiar to me, I, I don't suspect everyone shares this, but one of the things that I think is really important is to emphasize to students how rare it is to come to college, to get to have an education for its own sake, and not to rush them into the real world, not to confuse leadership training with life in the real world. The thing is that in a certain way, um, students feel the pressure to get the best internship and the best grades and win awards and prizes because that's the pathway to leadership. I would say take a moment for leisure, take some time to graze on the riches of the mind for four years. That might benefit you more than getting the best internship and getting the best grades and all these sorts of things. Don't, don't be in a rush to see yourself as a human resource. Uh, that's degrading in a way. You're more than a human resource. You're, you're a human being. And so take for four years of your life time to develop the full capacity and energies yourself as a human being. And that might benefit you long term. And so I'd like to, you know, to, um, to see us emphasize that a bit more. But uh, I think CU's done a terrific job. I love that, Dr. Brooks. Um, I myself wish when I was back in college, I had done a summer abroad or a semester, you know, what do they call it? At sea. I don't even, that's what we called it back in the day, but I, I missed all of that. I missed all of that in college and I, and I hate that. Um, okay. We're now going to, before we go to the questions, man, we are running out of time. Um, we're going to go to some poll questions um, uh, real quick. And so I want everybody, please, I know you're in line, you've been listening, get ready, get up to your, your keyboards and and, and, and get ready to answer um, 
these questions. And so here we go. We're going to, let's see here. Is the poll question There it is, there it is. Okay, what from CU helped shaped you as a leader is question one. And what is your top leadership strength? Okay, I'm gonna say it again, <clears throat> put it in the chat here. What from CU helped shaped you as a leader and what is your top leadership strength? We just wanna, I'm gonna just read a couple and then we're going right to the question. Um, and then I'm going to Mr. Notice, Kenoti, I, I believe it is question, because that is a good one. All right, empathy. Uh-oh, listen to there. Dr. Johnson, student government participation. Good. Um, I see you support as a leader, self-motivated research as an undergrad. Um, this is, all, this is good. Critical thinking. Wow. Come on now. Just showing up. Learn how to deal with people. <laughs> I will tell you, leadership is about dealing with folks. I'm telling you right now. Um, that is so important. So this is good. Keep, keep putting these, um, these questions in. I'm going to come over here and start looking at the audience questions. And boy, there are some good ones. We have, uh, for Mr. Kenodi here, what happens, and this is for our panelists, and I'm just going to direct it to one panelist because we're short on time and we're just going to keep going through these. What happens when there are limited opportunities for leadership by design or otherwise? How do we choose inclusivity and diversity, and I would say equity, in that environment? And so, Dr. Johnson, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you uh, to dive into that. We've been talking about all these opportunities of leadership, but we haven't talked about an environment where there has been hundreds and thousands of years of barriers. Go ahead. Yeah, I, <laughs> I mean, that is a good question. I have to say, I get it, the question all the time as, you know, I believe we need to be more inclusive and have more diversity in our leadership roles. And, and I think there's a lot of fear from majority group members that maybe that means their opportunities will be less lessened. Yeah. I think the data don't really support that. Um, I think that's assuming a very fixed pie. Um, but if you're talking about business, by increasing diversity, you might also achieve other things like increasing market share, capturing new target markets, new customers, you know, growing the business. But if you want to be um, provocative and say, okay, we're talking about senators and each, there's only two per state, we're not going to grow that um, anytime soon. Then, no. you know, I think that, um, there's going to be times where we choose the best person for the job or we, uh, and those characteristics that we're choosing for are going to be, you know, that are going to favor one group over another. I think we have a really long history of choosing characteristics that favor the majority. And there's been a lot of opportunity. And I think we're kind of at the point where for the greater good, and it's not lowering the bar and all those things that people say, but I think we need to be providing more opportunities for people who haven't typically been in those leadership roles. And I like the, I use the example of Senator because that's where people get to vote. And so yeah. the people get to choose who they wanna see. I think that's a great answer. I, I, and I think for all of our listeners, I think we have to address barriers in our society. <laughs> um, and if, if you don't, believe or understand those barriers. We'll do another show on what those barriers are, um, but we got to address that. And that's going to be part of leadership, whatever position that you're in, looking at the historic and systemic barriers that uh, prevent people from being in leadership. All right. If we Dr. do that, can we bring your mom on? <laughs> <laughs> she would, hey, I don't know if y'all ready for Dr. Brooks. Uh, she, she would be great at this. Okay. Um, now the other Dr. Brooks, um, I have a question for you. How, uh, this is from Ken. Ken, thanks for asking this question. How are you, how are we at CU measuring the effectiveness and progress of teaching leadership skills as part of a CU education? Yeah, I mean, that's a, a difficult question. I, I would say this, um, 
I'm not convinced that everything in human life admits of measurability. So think about how much you love your significant other or how much you love your children. Is that one or 90 or five? I wonder if leadership admits of, um, of numerical value. We live in a world where we think that, that the, the um, marker for success is assigning discrete quantity to concepts which are not, I can see one apple, but I can't very well see one unit of justice. And so it's not clear to me how we would measure on any conventional scale. I know uh, Dr. Johnson may have uh, disagreements uh, about this and, and may have more insight into it, but for my money, I'm not sure that we can measure. All we can do is what a good parent can do, which is to try to take care of the birds in the nest, as it were, then kick them out, and then hope that we've equipped them with enough humane skills to uh, navigate the world. And so I, I would very much love to be able to give you an answer and a graph and a, a slide and these sorts of things. I, I don't know that that's what you're asking for. Um, I can't provide it, but I'm not convinced that if I could, it would be satisfying or that it would be uh, truth telling in any way, because I'm not sure you quantify numerically the kind of thing we're trying to do with these programs. Hey, Dr. Brooks. I love that answer. Dr. Johnson, I'm not going to allow you to banter uh, on, on this one um, because we've got to get going, but I love that. I, I've always said leadership is more caught than taught, <laughs> and I think that gets to some of what you're, you're, you're talking about. It's tough to measure, um, tough to measure that, but I appreciate the question. I think it's a really good one. Okay, uh, this is uh, for Brian. Brian, this is an interesting question. It comes from Joshua. Joshua, I appreciate you asking this. How do we engage more students on the path to enhance diversity in leadership? How do we engage more students on the path to enhance diversity in leadership? What do you think, Brian? I think make leadership less of a scary concept. I think a lot of students see it as it's it's uh, as a really big role you have to fill. You have to be a certain kind of person. You have to have a certain number of skills. Uh, if we can communicate to students that you don't have to have fit like a cookie cutter, be that person to be a leader. Like anyone can be a leader. Anyone can build the kind of skills to be a great leader. I think that would encourage a lot more students to participate and be leaders. Yeah. And, you know, I'd add on to that, it gets back to that barrier conversation too, right? Um, I think, uh, you know, there are a lot of programs that are like, well, we, we're not getting any diverse students or we're not getting any, um, you know, any female students or whatever it is, because we haven't put the proper outreach methods and haven't assessed the barriers that have existed. Um, and so, you know, that's why as well. But I, I love what you said, Brian, around we make leadership uh, like you're running for the president, uh, office of the president, um, instead of um, leadership should be enhanced in every situation. Um, a little bit what, what Dr. Johnson was saying. Um, this actual question is for Dr. Johnson. Uh, Gordon, I really appreciate it. Um, what is being done at the Center for Leadership to provide experiential learning opportunity. This gets back to what Dr. Brooks said that we can't just have an academic environment. Um, the world helps us to kind of learn. So what are your thoughts on that, Dr. Johnson? Yeah, I, I mean, we're definitely, that's a big part of the Leadership Center is um, we are trying to offer some classes, but it's really more of the hands-on experience. So we've tried to create a mentoring program similar to what Mr. Trafton funded for leads um, at a campus-wide level and engage um, students with community leaders and business leaders doing service um, and even have looked into some outdoor leadership experiences for students. Um, definitely open to feedback. Like a lot of the, that's the long-term goal of the center is to provide a variety of opportunities. I don't know that we have built out an endless number, but you know we're starting down that path. Um, definitely with that co-curricular and experiential at the very heart of what we're doing. Yep, it's really good. Ken H has a question that 
I'm going to uh, have Dr. Brooks uh, take on. It's something that I've done a little, a lot of thinking about in, in my business. Um, but Ken says, is the empowered workforce still seen as a key competitive advantage? And is remote work hurting or helping it? Um, I, you know, my view is uh, remote things are, are, are never very good. Um, I mean, and again, I'm not an expert on this. The only thing I know is uh, what I read in the Wall Street Journal and, and what I reflect uh, on in my own classes. I, my sense is that there's something, um, and again, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but there's something dehumanizing about remote work. You know, there's all these questions in the press now about whether one can get promotions if one is only a remote worker, and if one stay, if one works in the office, do you have these advantages and these sorts of things? But I would just say, you know, successful enterprises are built on on community. Uh, Brian points out, community is very, very important. And it's difficult to form the kind of genuine and lasting human bonds and friendships uh, by way of remote work that are going to uh, gel a community uh, around an enterprise that sets it up for success, that sets it up for uh, people who know other people and who are willing to give them the benefit of the doubt when they do something wrong or make mistakes and say, you know what, you're, you're, that's okay. We, we can, you know, I know you, I, I know who you are. I've been over to your house. I've met your, your kids, you know, these sorts of things, these kind of genuine communities that make us more tolerant of one another, more eager to, as, as people have put it, serve one another. It's not clear to me that these sorts of things can, um, can exist by way of Zoom. And so I do worry uh, deeply about that trend, although I'm not uh, certainly an expert on it. Yeah, I mean, my, my sense is that at, at our business, we have 180 employees. And I, I'll tell you what, if, if you want to keep uh, a great organization, a great business, you've got to have culture and you can't do culture behind a computer screen. And so I think it, it, it will hurt over time and um, it will be interesting what happens here in the next 18 to 24 months. Um, this is a question. I'm actually going to give this to Brian. Um, let's see here. Uh, here it is by Tim. Will leadership become more or less important in the modern age of technology and the advent of automation? Figure you're, you're in, in that generation, Brian, that, uh, you can see all this, man. You, you know, you know, what's going to happen. So what are your thoughts on that? Um, I think leadership will still be important because even though there's all these kind of things that are making humans not connect on the way we connected before, they are still connecting in ways. There are still communities going on, people communicating with each other. So I feel like there will still be leaders that emerge in this new digital age and use technology to their advantage as either a skill to dominate other people or to either build more communities and make, uh, make more things better. I don't know if that answered the question completely. No, it's very good. Very good. Okay. We are literally out of time, but I can't end this because I love the conversation that's going on. So we're going to ask one more question um, because I, I just think this is so good. I'm energized um, and I feel like you guys are, are literally dropping so much wisdom on all of our viewers. And I hope this is recorded it is recorded. They're saying it's recorded, so we can get this out. You guys can take this um, uh, to your friends and folks who weren't able to, to jump on board. But our last question um, is really going to be all three, and I'm going to ask you guys to try and keep it you know, to 20, 30 seconds about what's your biggest challenge in learning about leadership? And this um, doesn't say who this came from, but thank you for the question. What is your biggest challenge in learning about leadership? We'll start with you, Dr. Brooks. Um, I think uh, a, a challenge for learning about anything, leadership in particular, but anything is um, remembering that, that there are points in the juncture when you need to change your mind. Like don't, don't become a person who can no longer change their mind. A person who's so wedded to their convictions, wedded to an old sense of what they thought the truth was, that new evidence, new reasons can't persuade you. Got it. Dr. Johnson? Oh my God, that was totally my answer. Um, 
So <laughs> why you guys agree? I know. I was just reading Adam Grant's new book, <laughs> which is like learn how to change your mind. But um, I, you know, I think the other one is recognizing that it's never ending. Like I you want to be done, right? Like I want to get better at this and then therefore I will have mastered or achieved success. You want to have a mastery of the topic. And when it comes to leadership, at least for me, I've studied it for 20 years and I am not a master and the, the landscape is changing. And so it's impossible to be done because there's always new things to learn. Like some of the things, Albus, that you said about COVID and, you know, the remote environment, yeah. like that wasn't true two years ago. And so <laughs> you can never be done. Brian? Uh, I think a big challenge of leadership is applying it after you learn certain skills with leadership. It's not like with other classes or things where you, you learn an equation and you put it down on a test and boom, you're a master, you know? Like with leadership, there are so many different uh, obstacles that can get in your way, so many different situations you can see as a leader that, uh, like Stephanie said, it's never ending. You're constantly learning. And you're constantly yeah, learning how to be a better leader and how to apply yourself better. So true. And I would, I would just say, uh, closing out for me, because I think leadership is a continual lesson, is that breaking the habit of being yourself, right? And so this is an incredible book. I've read it. Um, you know, it's continuing to break that every, every, every day. Um, but in order to respect everyone's time, um, as well as the time of the, the panelists, we must bring this event to a close. So um, thank you so much uh, for joining us in this incredibly thoughtful and engaging um, conversation. On behalf of CU Boulder, I want to once again extend a sincere gratitude to Dr. Uh, DeStefano and Stephanie Johnson and Dr. Shiloh and to Brian um, for their being here. And of course, thank you to all of you for tuning in and for your participation in this conversation. Uh, even though uh, in this instance, the discussion is over and I hope we don't leave it to a discussion. There are many ways for you to keep um, this conversation going uh, with the University of Colorado's uh, efforts around leadership. Uh, we've partnered with CU's Volunteer Resource Center, CU's Office of Advancement to share ways that you can stay involved and to learn uh, more about leadership and to develop leadership skills and how to develop your leadership skills. You will find this information as well as some incredible resources and opportunities provided by the panelists on the event website. So have an excellent evening um, and thank you again for joining us. Good night.